Okay, hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and hopefully we're in business here, and um, this is going to be our quiz for today, and um, I know Lily has posted a bunch of cases for you, um, probably about seven cases, and I'm now going to show you a, uh, the discussion to those cases, and what we actually see, and what is actually going on. So, let's go forward. So, here's the first case, flank pain. You notice that there's decreased attenuation in the patient's left kidney with stranding around the left kidney seen. And you could see that very nicely as we go through a series of images, the decreased attenuation in portions of the patient's left kidney with stranding around the left kidney seen. The patient's renal vein and artery both look good. So what are you thinking? Well, you're seeing decreased perfusion and you're thinking perhaps this is going to be infection or inflammation. It's one of the two, okay? One of the two possibilities. It doesn't look like a tumor like a TCC. Here it is nicely, it involves about two thirds of the kidney, the irregularity of the cortical medullary interface when you look at the 3D images. And here you can see it very nicely in coronal as well as 3D, just a very nice visualization of the process. Here it is on the excretory phase imaging where the areas of decreased attenuation are nicely seen. And so the answer, what is this? Well, the distribution, the changes in the cortical medullary interface, all of those findings, that's very good for a renal infarct. The patient had a recent stent place in the left renal artery, and this was an infarct. Again, I always think about pyelonephritis when I see decreased attenuation, but the geographic changes, particularly the cortical medullary interface, the decreased attenuation, focus more on a vascular process. And that was the answer. Okay, next case. We showed you this image in a patient with abdominal pain. And if you look carefully, I'm focusing on this one mass in the left kidney, but there's also a second mass more anteriorly. And then you say, well, maybe it's renal cell carcinoma. I guess you can get two renal cells, or is it an abscess in this patient with abdominal pain? What's going on? You look, the patient also has enlarged nodes in the left periodic region. There's mild dilatation of the pancreatic duct, perhaps. And then as you look at more images, including axial and coronal, you really see very nicely the mass in the patient's left kidney, and in fact, multiple masses, including something in the perirenal zone on the left side. And so you say, well, what could this be? It's solid, it must be a tumor. Renal cell, multiple renal cells are possible, but then involvement of the perirenal space. Could it be an abscess? not enough stranding, and abscesses are usually lower density. And then you have the adenopathy, so you gotta think about infection, but still, adenopathy, solid masses in the kidney, more nodes in the periodic region. This was an example of lymphoma. This is B-cell lymphoma. And we always talk about renal masses, and we always tend to focus, all of us tend to focus on looking at masses and assuming we're dealing with renal cell carcinoma. I think the important thing to remember is there are more things than renal cell carcinoma. We often see lymphoma with bulky adenopathy, but lymphoma may not have bulky adenopathy. And so this is a really nice example of B-cell lymphoma. Another patient, so remember the seven cases I showed you all had abdominal pain. Well, this patient, pancreas looks good, spleen's a little large, but there's an infiltrating process in the mesentery. That is the finding. You see that whole infiltrating process here. What's going on? Well, if you look a little bit more carefully, you can see the bowel is displaced. There's calcifications or vessels in the middle of this thing, and it's of low CT attenuation. It doesn't look like lymphoma. It's the right location for big nodes, but it doesn't look like nodes. You can see on the MIP, the vessels, the SMA is stretched, but it's not really solid. It's also not fat density because surely you could think of something like a liposarcoma. But it's low density, but not fat density. It's mass-like, and it's this model density. When you see low density, you always want to think about things like lymphatics. I've showed you lymphangiomas. I've showed you lymphopathelial cysts. This is the most impressive example of a large mesenteric mass which displaces bowel but doesn't obstruct bowel. Here it is on the cinematic rendering. You can see the density in red, the, the mesenteric mass. 
And what this is, great case, just a few more images to show you, is a primary process in the mesentery, and it was a lymphangioma, okay? Dilated vessels, but just a beautiful case of lymphangioma. Unusual, retroperitoneal and mesenteric lymphangiomas are uncommon, but that's the correct diagnosis. Okay, another patient, abdominal pain. Another pri process in the mesentery, but here you see dense calcifications. Mesenteric mass with dense calcifications, I'm thinking of carcinoid. Then I'm also thinking about sclerosing mesenteritis, if the patient had lymphoma and was treated, treated nodes perhaps. When you look at more of these images, you can see the mass involves the region of the SMA, but if this was a carcinoid, you would see more soft tissue and not so much calcification. Also with a carcinoid in the mesentery, it always causes desmoplastic reaction. And so you would see encasement and irregularity of the SMA and often of the SMV. You don't see any of that. As I show you the different images, you can see how the SMA and its branches actually are fine. Just a really nice case. So what could this be? Mesenteric mass with calcification. Patient had no therapy. This is not carcinoid. It's not a desmoid tumor. This is the classic appearance of sclerosing mesenteritis. Sclerosing mesenteritis is a difficult diagnosis because it's benign. It can cause fibrosis and cause mass effect. It's always simulating a malignancy. It's a really hard diagnosis to make, but a very important diagnosis for the radiologist to think about because he or she may be the only person thinking about it. Another patient, left upper quadrant pain. Well, what do you see? You see ascites. You also notice the bowel, particularly the right colon, is thickened. And that's the image I gave you. When you look further downward in the sigmoid colon, there's thickening, but also very prominent mucosal enhancement. There's inflammation in the mesentery. There's some ascites present. You can see it's essentially a pan colitis. You can see the folds look abnormal diffusely throughout the colon. And here's just a few more images of that. So now I ask you, what gives me an acute abdomen, abdominal pain? The entire colon is distended. The entire colon is thickened. There's ascites and mucosal enhancement. It's not going to be ischemic colitis. It's not going to be ulcerative colitis. The ulcerative colitis can have a similar appearance, but this was an acute episode, okay? Look at the rectum and sigmoid colon, the very bright mucosal enhancement. It's somewhat smooth. You might think of more regularity with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. So what is this? What colitis is a pan colitis? It's the most common colitis to give you ascites. It comes on relatively quickly, no long history. Usually it's a patient who's been hospitalized or had surgery, was on antibiotics. And this was a case of C. difficile colitis. And this was such a bad case, though the images aren't as bad as perhaps the patient's condition, the patient uh, did not survive surgery. There was, it was emergency surgery because they were worried about the patient perforating the bowel. And unfortunately, C. difficile colitis usually can be treated conservatively, but sometimes the colon can perforate and sometimes patients can die from C. diff colitis, particularly older patients with multiple comorbidities. Another patient with abdominal pain. Well, there's a lesion in the right kidney. That was an incidental renal cell. I'm giving you that. I'm asking you, what's the mass in the pelvis? The mass is four centimeters or five centimeters. It's vascular. Now, it's closely related to the small bowel. So what could this be? Is it abutting the small bowel or coming from the small bowel? Here it is nicely shown in the coronal perspective. Here it is nicely shown again in the coronals. So what am I thinking? If it's coming off bowel, then perhaps I'm thinking of a GIST tumor. GIST can be very vascular. They often come off small bowel. They don't obstruct. They're exophytic. I think that's a really good thought, and particularly I like GIST tumors, so that probably is a great thought. There it is again. This patient underwent surgery. Um, what else gives you vascular lesions? You can have METs. You can have carcinoid tumors, but there's no desmoplastic reaction, so that's less likely. But you also can have um, neuroendocrine tumors, paragangliomas. Very nice mass. There it is on the um, patient's cinematic rendering. 
Here it is when I play around a little bit with the vessels feeding the lesion. When I show you the vascularity, I show you the relationship to the vessels. Again, lots of nice views. And this ended up being a paraganglioma. Again, paragangliomas, we talk about them as extra adrenal field chromocytoma sometimes, organ of zircocondyl near the adrenal bed, but pelvis can be a possibility, and this was a great case of a paraganglioma. Again, I was ready to put this in my gist file, but I couldn't do it. Another case of abdominal pain. The key finding here, and maybe this is a bit unfair, is the stomach. Look how thick the stomach is in the fundus and body of the stomach. Beautifully shown on the coronal views. Lymphoma is a possibility, big, thick, and folds, but it wouldn't spare the antrum. Carcinoma would not have that transition either. Um, you could think about gastritis, but again, the folds are so thickened and enhancing, and also the sparing of the antrum would be unusual. It almost looks mass-like in the way it spares things. There's no adenopathy, there's no other findings. There is a serous cyst adenoma in the head of the pancreas, which is why we originally did the study. So what is this? What gives you such thickened gastric folds that's not lymphoma, that's not gastritis? This doesn't look like metastatic breast cancer, that's linitis plastica, it involves the entire stomach. It doesn't look like just gastritis, eosinophilic gastritis. You name it, it doesn't look like it. What could this be? Look at the fold thickening on the MIP and on the cinematic rendering. Very, very impressive. That's the very impressive is not a diagnosis. This was Minitrier's disease. Classic hypertrophic gastric folds in the fundus and body. A very uncommon diagnosis, but just a spectacular example. Okay, that must be the seven cases I showed you because I put here beyond the seven. So let me show you some cases you haven't seen. Here's a patient with a dilated pancreatic duct, and I wanna make a point here. There's a dilated pancreatic duct. You don't really see a mass in the head of the pancreas or in the body of the pancreas right away. When you look at the arterial, the duct is cut off. We've told you many times, and I'll tell you again, or I'll share with you again, the most common reason people miss early pancreatic cancer is because of a dilated pancreatic duct without a mass and they just simply don't worry about it. Well, our rule is if you see a pancreatic duct that's dilated and abrupt cutoff, there's a malignancy there whether you see it or not. Less than 5% of pancreatic cancers can be iso-dense. This is one example perhaps. Interestingly, when you go from the arterial to the venous, the lesion seems to be enhancing more you would typically see decreased enhancement with an adenocarcinoma. Then when you look harder, that lesion is actually in the duct, obstructing, it's enhancing. Beautiful, beautiful example. What could this be? Well, Satomi Kawamoto wrote the article a number of years ago. This is the class. Tonin, it causes a desmoplastic reaction which narrows the duct and causes the ductal obstruction. So this is a beautiful example of a neuroendocrine tumor causing duct obstruction. Most of the time you're going to see this and you're going to be having adenocarcinoma. Also it's unusual for neuroendocrine to be more bright on the venous than arterial, but we always see exceptions to every rule. Another case, here's a great case of jaundice. Look at the patient's common duct. You're thinking about cancer in this patient in their 70s, but there's something in the common duct. And when you follow it down on the coronal, and again, the value of coronal, there's a mass in the common duct. And although when you see dilated ducts and jaundice in a patient who's in their 70s, you're always thinking pancreatic cancer, there may be a thinking duodenal cancer invading in, or an ampullary cancer, or a liver tumor, you do have obstruction due to ducts, it may be a patient with a gallbladder, or like this case, who had a prior cholecystectomy. And look how it looks like an oval-shaped mass blocking the duct. This patient was very lucky. They do ERCP, they remove the stone, and the patient is fine. You want to look very carefully. Here it is nicely on the venous. When you have that appearance, always think about the possibility of a stone, and a non-opaque stone can really fool you. Again, remember, you do not need to, to have 
opaque stones. You can have non-opaque stones like this, and you also don't need to have a gallbladder. Just a beautiful, beautiful example of a stone impacting at the level of the common duct. Here's some 3D views of that. Just a wonderful case where the patient spared a Whipple's procedure, gets an ERCP with stone removal, and life is good. I think this is the last case. What's the mass? Nice hypervascular lesion, body tail junction. This is the classic appearance of a neuroendocrine tumor. I wanted to show this case because you see how it invades into the splenic vein and it has a crescent. Neuroendocrine tumors evade and give you that scallop appearance into vessels. When you have adenocarcinoma, it encases and may occlude the vessel, but doesn't give that meniscus sign. Beautiful finding in patients with neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. Again, with MIP imaging, nicely showing you the vascularity. Venous phase shows you how quickly the lesion washes out. Perhaps if you looked here, you would say adenocarcinoma. So arterial phase really is of great value. Okay, you see it very nicely here. Here it is on cinematic rendering. Vascular lesion, obstruction, invasion, neuroendocrine tumor. So that's probably 10 cases. I hope you enjoyed them. And remember the third Thursday, I think, of each month, Lily reminds me to show you a series of cases. So with that, I hope you liked it and have a great day.